coming up on Push to Talk. The gang plus Laren recaps E3 2019, and we check out how we did on our bingo predictions. So stick around for an extended show this week, and please enjoy. This is Push to Talk, episode 28, recorded Sunday, June 16th, 2019. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash push to talk and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Then download a title for free and start listening. I am your host, Jan, alongside Joe and Bill. Welcome back, Bill. He's finally mostly recovered, and we're also joined again by Laren, who sat in graciously for Bill over the last two weeks, and we figured we'd have her back as we wrap up our E3 coverage, and it was only fair if we asked Laren to predict things for E3 that we'd also have her back to sort of go through the uh, aftermath and see how wrong, how right we were. Um, Hey, everybody, how's it going? Good. Good. It's going well. How are you doing, Bill? You were uh, near death's door as far as man flu levels were concerned yeah if uh if fans of the simpsons like old school the simpsons remember grandpa simpson i forget what episode or what context it was but there's a scene where i believe everything he sees he just goes death <laughs> has basically been me for the better part of a month and i'm gonna choke and cough and possibly die on this podcast but i'm here well that's okay we've got four of us here so you don't have to you know you've only got to talk for about 25 percent of the time more or less yeah you, you can, can all right you can, you can lose somebody you'll be all right yeah. So, Joe, how's um, how's the house move coming? Have you started settling in? A little bit. A uh, little bit. Painting, you know, trying to make it look nice, trying to make it not look like a, a mint chocolate chip sundae, because that's what it looked like when I came in. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking when they went to Sherwin-Williams, but it is rough. Was the house built in the 70s? Or? F- 50s. Oh, okay. 50s. But, but the paint, I think, was only a few years old, so a modern-day tenant decided that was a good color. So. I'm looking forward to conversations with Joe because I've been where Joe is recently and you get a lot of plans when you buy a house. You're like, we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And that lasts for like 60 days. And then you're just like, screw it. It's <laughs> fine the way it is. And you just move on. You're like, I'm not, no, I'm not doing it. Like all summer long, I've been like, oh, I need to dig up that part of my lawn and put down grass seed and make it look lush. Hasn't happened. Nope. Huh. Well, from what I understand, you just let the local wildlife do the digging for you in your yard. Yeah, that happens. And I also have to leave some things in my yard that I really didn't want to leave because rabbits have uh, made a nest in there. So oh. I don't want to uh, I don't want to expel them. So that's nice of you. That is very nice of you. Uh, so, how, Laren, how was your past week? You, I assume, paid a lot of attention to E3. It's been a pretty, pretty busy week for anybody uh, covering E3 and writing news articles and just generally trying to keep up with what's going on. Yeah, it's been a lot to take in, but you know, we had some exciting announcements, so it wasn't too bad. We did indeed. So last episode, we already talked about EA Play, so we're going to skip that this week. But I think it would uh, would behoove us all to sort of share a little bit of our opinions of what we liked or didn't like, missed, or wish we had seen at the various major press conferences. And we can start with Microsoft, who basically kicked things off on Sunday, exactly a week ago. Um, and I feel like Microsoft... Uh, you know, with the absence of Sony this year, I feel like a lot of stuff fell onto Microsoft. You know, Sony and Microsoft are always the big two. And um, what did you guys think if I just open up the floor? Like, Microsoft had some pretty big announcements. They certainly had what is, in my opinion, one of the biggest surprises of E3. Maybe we just start with that, why beat around the bush. Um, but Bill, what did you think of Microsoft's conference and, and what they did there on Sunday? Uh, I was pretty impressed, actually. Um, I typically find Microsoft press conferences to be very underwhelming, and I find Microsoft and Xbox overall to be pretty underwhelming. And uh, but I had I was impressed. Um, I mean, they managed to snag obviously the Cyberpunk release date announcement with Keanu Reeves. So I mean, that kind of inserts the fun into the press conference, if nothing else. Um, Cyberpunk having a release date is huge. But uh, Project Scarlet, I mean. I think we expected, or some people expected that announcement. I didn't, um, but I also didn't really investigate whether or not there was a likelihood they would announce it. I just kind of guessed, like, eh, they probably won't talk about that, but they did. So I think they did really, really well, Microsoft. Um, 
I'm still not a huge Xbox guy, but what did happen is when they announced, um, or they didn't announce it, but they talked about their, uh, what is it, Game Pass Ultimate? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. Yeah, so I bought that um, because I'm now in the position where I'm happy to spend, say, 100 bucks a year on Xbox and 100 bucks on Ubisoft and 100 bucks on um, on EA and be able to play a backlog of games, but also get access to new games coming out. So I did buy uh, Game Pass Ultimate. So I have to be impressed by them because normally I don't care at all about the things that they do and they talk about. But in this case, I actually did. So well done to them, I guess. Yeah, I would say that first Sunday was expensive for some gamers. There was, uh, you know, pre-orders opened up for Cyberpunk. And I was trying to, and still am trying to get a hold of the collector's edition. Still haven't seen it pop up on any sort of Canadian retail site. You said it was briefly on Best Buy and then immediately sold out. So No, uh, it's unavailable, but that might mean that it's not. Has like a, there's listings there, but they may just not have hit there yet. Yeah, I mean, I have the Amazon Canada page open <laughs> for the Cyberpunk collector's edition, and I am literally refreshing it on a daily basis, just waiting for it to appear. Um but Xbox Game Pass Ultimate kind of combines uh, what was previously known as Game Pass already. And the nice thing about it is that not only does it include Xbox, and I believe it includes Xbox uh, Live now as well, like the gold stuff, right? Right. Yeah, Somebody correct me. If I'm, yeah. yeah, so no, it does. They've, they've bundled it all together, and it actually is cheaper than buying things individually, which is always nice. And of course, it includes a lot of the PC versions of games that are included in their Game Pass, which is the reason I bought it originally. I mean, I, I have an Xbox. I hardly ever, I, I don't use it. But, you know, for example, Sea of Thieves is included in the Game Pass, and that's one of the games I like playing, so I, I play that via that. And it seems like Microsoft will likely have more and more titles in the future, especially even some of the new titles that are coming out that they announced. So I hope so. I know Gears 5 value. is going there, right? Um, Gears 5 yeah. is listed as one of the selling points of xbox game pass ultimate when i bought it a couple days ago but one thing i will say is that so i bought it i did my windows 10 update um that was required in order to get like the new whatever xbox app on my pc yes and then i started looking for games available in X xbox game pass ultimate and i was very underwhelmed there's not a lot of games that i was like oh wow i can't wait to play that in comparison to like if i go into origin because i have origin access premiere if I go in there and look, there's tons of games that I'm like, wow, that's really cool. I, you know, probably won't play that right now, but totally would. I didn't have that with Xbox. What I found was it was a lot of things like, well, here's the ultimate edition of this game. We were going to charge you $129 for it, but now we're going to charge you $100 for it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas there just wasn't as many free games as I thought. And that could be one of two things. Either there just aren't that many free games right now, or their app is awful and I can't find them. And I'm willing to think it's probably a coin toss, honestly. But um, it's yeah. also the most expensive of the the big three. It was two hundred dollars for a year. It is. It's not not the cheapest one of the of the new sort of subscription services, but it does sort of you know it, it remains to be seen. Like it does include some games that I don't necessarily need to play on launch day. So my hope is kind of like you mentioned, Gears Five, great. But I I, I won't I won't be sitting here on launch day, itching to play it. It's one of those games that maybe in the future I'll play at some point. Like, I still haven't played Gears 4, which is part of the Game Pass as well. Um, Halo Infinite, though, is not included in the Game Pass, at least not from what I can tell, but I'm hoping that in the future at some point, maybe a couple months after launch or something, it will be included, because that's the kind of game that I want to play, um, but I'm not I'm not likely to buy it outright. So at, at some point, we're going to have to do a, a recap and a comparison of all the various subscription services. I actually made a list the other day because it's starting to get plentiful. There's quite a few of them. Joe, you play on Xbox, correct? So much. So much? <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your opinion on the Game Pass? Is that something that you've actually uh, looked up, used, purchased? or I like loaded up on like their promotional era when it wasn't as popular and bought like several gift cards. And I think in total I've spent $60 on what amasses to be three years. Wow. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty stocked up because I think they were really trying to get the word out and uh, I knew that I would want it and I'm glad I did that. So I have like two and a half years left and uh, I, I think it's an outstanding value. And I don't know if that's bias speaking because I, I tend to like the Xbox side of things, side of the industry, but been I've been pretty impressed with the more recent additions and after seeing the press conference 
last weekend, I was really impressed with the with the titles that they're bringing, especially day and date with the normal release. So I think it's headed in a good direction. Yeah, a lot of the titles will be included on launch day, right? So that there's no there's yeah. no having to wait for it, which is pretty cool. Yeah, there were. Th- I, I'm I'm reading an article on uh, Microsoft.com, and 34 of the 60 games that were discussed at the conference go direct to Game Pass or are coming mm-hmm. to Game Pass, which is pretty good ratio of things that they're that they're trying to tout, right? That you as a subscriber would simply get by being in the you know in the subscription base, which is pretty like tantalizing prospect because it's a really low cost. Um, comparatively to just gaming in general which you know anytime a release hits you got to drop 60 plus tax like it adds up so it depends on what games for me though because if it really is sort of like the the top of the pile games great then i agree wholeheartedly but if it's just a bunch of like 10 to 15 dollar games then for me that doesn't really do it you know um so if something like halo infinite's not on there that's almost a deal breaker for me i believe it's not on there for pc players that's that's more of a pc issue it is on there for xbox subscribers right yeah Yeah. and i think that's just they don't make in a pc version at launch anyway right which is sort of so that that remains a xbox exclusive which is really and i think it's going to be one of their launch titles for scarlet isn't that right that's right yeah yep um but i mean I was going to say, like, right. you know, in terms of talking about top shelf stuff, Halo Infinite that is there, obviously, the Outer Worlds coming, right? This is where we start to see the fruits of Microsoft's labor last last year, where they were purchasing all these uh, studios and trying to sort of eliminate the uh, notion that Sony's the place to get the great content, even if Microsoft has, you know, quote unquote, the better console experience or the better networking experience or something. You could see, you could see them making... Uh, efforts to try and eliminate that that uh, you know that pretty wide held uh, view of the brand and and this year seeing what they were touting and the things that they're bringing to the console and to Game Pass again direct to Game Pass I, I, to me it's like they're doing it I, I think this the, they're finally like sort of putting the puzzle pieces together um, and all of it leading up to a new console release like it really it really makes me feel like me investing in this console this brand for the past six seven well if you consider all the other consoles 15 20 years like you know i i feel like that investment was worthwhile right everything that i own i can play on this new console and um you know all of all of my gamer points all of my (laughs) all of my uh gamer tag associated data right like there's something to that that finally feels like they finally bundled it up and now it's going to be an affordable nice experience on a like all-in-one uh, console coming out. I'm more of a bandwagon guy. See, I, I look at it and I'm like, man, Joe has had to suffer for six, seven years just so that he could have this payoff that they're finally putting the pieces <laughs> well, together. I and own a PS4 I was just, as well. I was riding the Sony wave for those years and all those exclusives and loving it. And now, but at the, in all seriousness, I hope they do really well because I don't want to dislike any game company or platform. I It only benefits every single gamer and all of us, if there's things that, if there's reasons for me to want to own Xbox Game Pass Ultimate and an Xbox, whatever version it happens to be, and that's great. Like, I want there to be content there. Like, Sea of Thieves was a big step for them with me because I re- that was really the first time that I had a reason to, like, go over and play something. Right. Um, so I hope they keep going in that direction. I hope Sony keeps going in that direction as well. Like, Right. And that's, everybody the, that's kind of the thing. Like, this, this really kind of forces Sony's hand to at the very least make a statement about what they're going to do because i mean netflix has been around forever and the commentary of like gaming is going to get there soon enough and like okay it's here we're there so sony either needs to do the same thing or say that they're not going to do the same thing and and that will really draw a line in the sand i think because this is this is like i said the value proposition i think is really strong right you know that's well, at least I'm, how i feel I'm, I'm curious about that actually i used to always think or and i think it was sort of wildly a wildly held widely held belief that Sony was ahead in terms of the quote unquote console wars, right? Yeah. Now, Sony's absence from E3 meant that they didn't have anything to say. Microsoft said a bunch of stuff, whether it's the new console, uh, X Cloud streaming service, you know, Game Pass, all that. Google obviously said a lot before E3 with their Stadia Connect. Um, some of the other press conferences also introduced some certain subscription plans. And of course, Sony, nothing. So I'm curious, does that actually hurt them what do you think laren like is that a in your opinion does sony's absence actually 
mean that they have no response for this. Like, we know what Microsoft's plan is. We know what Google's plan is. Sony's plan? Eh. I would say, yeah, it just, it kind of makes them look, I guess, bad, but it's it's just more confusing because I think a lot of people expected them to uh, make up for their absence at E3 with a state of play presentation at the very least. Um, but so far we've heard nothing and we haven't even heard of like, hey, we're planning to show something next month, blah, 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 nothing, nothing at all. And so um, I think the longer they wait, the, the worse it's going to make them look if they don't respond to all the things that were shown during E3. Because, I mean, there's no there's no arguing that Sony has got some enticing games in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've got uh, Last of Us 2, for one. Like, that's going to be one of those. That's that's a console seller. Um, but I don't know if there's any indication that that will be a PS5 title or not. Um, like, we know some information about the PS5. But in comparison now, if you just were to decide, what's my next console going to be? Is it going to be a PlayStation 5 or is it going to be Microsoft's thing? Microsoft seems to present more of an entire ecosystem. Like, if you buy into Microsoft's thing, you get a bunch of stuff. With Sony, it still seems almost archaic at this point, where it's like, what do you mean, I have to buy a console and then games individually? I feel like they definitely need to, at this point, catch up to at least that kind of, like, what is the plan here? I think they need to catch up, but with the subscription stuff, I think that's, and I think they will. I think Sony will announce a subscription because everyone does. So it's a matter of time. We don't know when that'll be. Um, and I don't think it makes Sony look weak that they weren't at E3. I think they they have The Last of Us 2 coming, which is going to be PS4. It's not going to be PS5. Um, they have Death Stranding coming this year. I think Sony's kind of taken the Rockstar approach to this. Rockstar wasn't at E3 last year. There was, I, my entire time in LA for eight days, I saw one billboard, not even close to E3, advertising Red Dead Redemption 2. Not a peep otherwise, not a peep. What happened? Probably the, what it, I mean, I haven't looked at it, but it's gotta be the highest selling game in the last little while, right? Pretty close, if not. I think Sony's looking at it the same way. They have Death Stranding coming. People are gonna buy consoles for that. They have The Last of Us coming. People are gonna buy consoles for that. Are they If though? anything, yeah, they are. For People sure, have they PS4s. Are. True, but not everyone. There's not everyone has a PS4. They always come out with new titles, whether in a couple of years ago, you know, being the Battlefront games and whatnot that that sold a lot of people that may not be traditional gamers on on PS4s. Now, I, I do believe it's not a good approach because it'll catch up with them, right? Um, it's almost like if you don't participate in the conversation, which Sony currently is not, then you better hit home runs every single time because. The minute that you fall or the minute that you have a bad year where you're not getting, you know, those banging good uh, PS4 exclusives that make people want to own a PS4, then you're in trouble, right? Because now you don't have the exclusives, you don't have the subscription service, maybe you don't have the backwards compatibility or whatever it happens to be, um, and it catches up to you. Right now, I think their arrogance is what is, uh, is their biggest thing they need to be worried about. Um, but they have a lot of history of de of delivering on ps4 exclusives that work and uh i i hope for the sake of sony and the people that like sony that they don't screw this up like they do need to have something they do need to be competitive in the ways that xbox showed us this year um but i don't think it's a weakness unless they never say anything if they if they wait a month and decide we're going to hold a state of play when there's no gaming news going around because we want to have the floor with no distractions, whatever. We don't want to do it at E3 where there's other news. We want to do it all on our own when no one's paying attention to anyone but us. That would be perfectly fine, assuming they actually do it, in yeah. my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think what they need to do is they need to come up with something that will actually, say, sell PlayStation 5s in the future. Because Microsoft now has Halo Infinite, which people will buy new consoles for. Um, they've done it in the past, right? Basically, like, every one of their major consoles has launched with a Halo launch title um for good reason it's, it's, it's like the iconic xbox game you think xbox you think halo um so it'll be interesting to see what sony does now i wish that microsoft had talked a little bit more about x cloud you know after all the google stadia talk that we had in the previous week and all this sort of streaming game service stuff microsoft was pretty light on x cloud and what it seemed like to me is that it's really just a service that will let you stream content from your xbox or an xbox sitting somewhere in a server center uh, that Microsoft owns, but it's not like it's it it's not I don't know it's a little weird to me. It seems almost like uh, Steam Link, where you're just streaming stuff from your console sitting at home. And I think Microsoft was trying to position that as a good thing, as in like it's your Xbox, it's your content, it's your connection. But all I could hear is like it's my connection, <laughs> it's my <laughs> crappy home internet. So 
I don't know, Joe, is that something that, like, you play games on the road a fair bit? I mean, arguably it's it's Nintendo Switch stuff, but, like, would it excite you to play Xbox games streamed to a mobile device I think while so. you're away from home? Yeah, the, with the one caveat being that, like, I used the PS4, PS Vita link quite a bit. Yeah. Um, oh, I forget what they called it, like, second screen or, I don't know, whatever. Uh, the streaming from the PS4 to the Vita screen I used quite a bit. And I used it to play... In most recent memory, um, Persona 5. And that was really good because Persona 5 is not a game that uh, demands you know, uh, low input lag and I don't care about the frame rate, resolution, blah, blah, blah. Um, and one could argue that the PlayStation in general caters more to that kind of gaming, whereas the Xbox um, demographic and, uh, I don't know, brand positioning just tends to be more of an action-oriented uh, platform. I know that's like a super broad stroke and it's uh, therefore pretty inaccurate, but if we have to paint broad strokes, I'm willing to say that. And I just don't know if I would, I don't know if my Xbox library of games that I'm thinking of right now would really be conducive to that sort of like second tier experience uh, that comes with, you know, in-home network streaming. That being said, I like the option of it, but um, I really do think it's relegated for like turn-based strategy games or rpgs and stuff yeah which i tend to play on the playstation or switch it doesn't it doesn't strike me as a real competitor to google stadia which is funny because that's all i ever heard when stadia was first announced everybody was basically or a lot of people were saying is well we'll see how google pulls this off but wait for microsoft to do the x cloud because microsoft will knock that out of the park and it will be so much better because microsoft has obviously more experience with you know the, the gaming ecosystem as a whole and and all that and then when i heard arguably what was very little information about it it was kind of deflating i was like that's that's what you're doing well, it was almost as okay. if they like on purpose were trying to skip over that part of the press conference it was so quick and uh, it was you know as you said they they did more position it as a way to stream your own xbox to another device yeah so maybe it's just well, not ready couldn't that be a result of testing and they're just finding out that it doesn't work. right now they don't have a way to make it as good as it needs to be, so they pivot a little bit to be it's more entirely like possible. A, right? I mean, they might look at that and be like, you know, we tried doing what Google's trying to do and it doesn't work well and Google's going to fall on their face and that could happen. I mean, honestly, that will remain to be seen. Um, uh, I was slightly hopeful that I would be excited in some way, shape, or form about xCloud, but I'm I'm not. And and oddly enough, I'm more and more excited about Stadia, which seems bizarre because, uh, Bill, when you and I first talked about this, I was like, this is going to be a crapshoot. It's going to be garbage. Come on. Yeah, but I know you. So I was like, okay, throw your tantrum. <laughs> um, and afterwards, here's the thing. I'm a genius, and everybody that's shitting on Stadia is not. Because we're looking at Stadia. This is like, what, going to be 1.0? Wait till 5.0. We're talking about first iteration here. It's going to have problems. But five years from now, internet connections are going to be better than they are today. Just like they are today compared to five years ago. And the technology is going to get better. And they're going to get better. And it's going to be a game changer. It's just the first PlayStation, yeah, it was groundbreaking, kind of like in the same way that maybe Stadia is groundbreaking, but I'm sure it had a lot of problems. You know, the first Nintendo and whatever used to have the blow on the stupid cartridges to get them to work. Like, it's, give it time. It, this is this is 1.0, or if, if that, right? So the idea to me is what's really cool. And I'm kind of, I don't know if I'm going to jump in on Stadia right away. I don't know if I have the need for it but I'm definitely paying close attention and I'm really excited to see where it goes. I want to see it grow and develop. And I think that it could be pretty cool if they continue and if they push for it. Sounds fair. Um, All right. So should we talk a little bit about cyberpunk in particular? I feel like cyberpunk is probably the the most anticipated title at E3 this year. (laughs) And it was last year as well. But I mean, this year we actually got to see quite a bit. Um, You mentioned earlier that, you know, Microsoft went through great lengths to keep uh, Keanu Reeves' appearance a secret. I read an article just yesterday about how they used stand-ins during rehearsals and only referred to him by a code name to, you know, really minimize all the leaks. And honestly, considering how much had leaked the week prior to E3, um, I was quite impressed that Microsoft managed to pull off a genuine surprise, not just in the gameplay trailer that basically ended with, Keanu Reeves, you know, and people realizing, oh my God, he's going to be in cyberpunk and then him walking onto stage, uh, which was pretty cool, I think. Definitely. Yeah, that was definitely the highlight of the show for me. So, Laren, are you, 
I don't remember if we talked about this, but cyberpunk, is that a, are you drawn to that? Is that oh, one of your yes. highly anticipated titles? Oh, yes. I'm yeah. very on board with anything CD Projekt Red does, so I've uh, been following Cyberpunk for a while. I didn't play the original pen and paper RPG. Uh, that was a little before my time, but um, I'm really excited for the new game. So, And I, I like Keanu Reeves, so that just made it even better. It's pretty interesting. I feel like he's been in a lot of neat things. Like, I mean, I, I saw John Wick 3 the other week, then I saw that Netflix movie, um, Always be my maybe or something like that <laughs> right yeah he's got a role in that as well which is it's funny he's like the same character in all of these he is he things, even looks the same weird. they didn't even change exactly his appearance the same. yeah acts the same he was on the stage he could have been john wick on the stage he could have been the the, the weird guy <laughs> from that <laughs> netflix movie um i don't know i don't know what happened that keanu reeves has blown up like this in the past few years i think it's great yeah but um it was I interesting like it was, saw a bit of that with kevin costner couple years ago maybe five ten years ago um kevin costner was like this big big guy in the 90s right like he did um oh hell i can't even remember he did robin hood that was one of them um he did dances with wolves which was interesting but yeah and then kevin costner just went away for like 15 years and you know it was just kind of a big joke and then all of a sudden he came back and uh now he's in some movies and has serious roles and people seem to have respect for him and keanu was like the speed guy and the matrix guy and then he just kind of i felt at least like he disappeared for a while and now he's just back as like awesome and it's just mm -hmm. like Where'd that come from? But maybe he was always awesome. Maybe I just missed it. I mean, did you see Point Break? He was always awesome. Yeah, but Bill that was heads. a long time ago, man. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying he went on hiatus though. Point. Yeah, Break I mean, he did don't do even, the John don't Wick don't movies, bring it here. but other than that, you, you, yeah, you're probably right. So I, I really like the John Wick movies too. Yeah, the first one I think is the best, but the second one has some really good action. They are they are, they are very entertaining. They're definitely not for younger people. No, <laughs> but they're very entertaining. Uh, summer adult chop your arms off kind of movie fair. So, uh, okay, so Cyberpunk itself though, um, it's coming out in April of next year, April sixteenth, which is not as far away as it might seem. I feel like time's going to go pretty quick until then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to um, be real quick, man. And we saw what, like a four minute trailer or so. It was a you know a, a reasonable amount of yeah, footage. Not yeah. ness was a gameplay. Not really. It was, That's what it's I was going to say. Cinematic. It's in engine, but it was cinematic because yeah. we we're not in V's perspective. So I wanted to ask you guys because Jan, you just said we saw a good bit of that game uh, a few minutes ago. You said that, and I was wondering, yeah. did I miss gameplay? Because I haven't seen gameplay last year. since last year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they showed behind closed doors footage this year. Um, okay. But at E3, when Keanu says, oh, now look at this, he points to like a quick montage that they do. Apparently a lot of that footage is in the behind closed doors, stuff that everybody ah, got to see. Cool. So we did see a little bit of gameplay. It was just like spliced up. I see. And I would imagine that if they follow what they did last year, um, that behind closed doors footage will be released at some point in the near future. That's right. what they yes. did after last yeah. year's E3. Uh, they confirmed you know, it. That's going to happen. Uh, we don't know yeah. exactly when, but probably around the time of Gamescom or PAX, PAX West. Yeah, so I guess towards the end of summer. Mm -hmm. I, ha I, have, I have heard that this year's Behind Closed Doors demo was much more interesting and exciting to some of the journalists that got to see it than last year's. And I mean, people were excited about last year, but I, the feeling that I get from that is that the game has progressed quite well and people are you know, genuinely excited about it coming to fruition. Cool. If I were any game studio... And I mean any game studio. Like if I was Rockstar and I was planning to release, you know, Red Dead 3 on about April 10th to April 25th next year, I would not. That's the kind of uh, that's the kind of draw that I think Cyberpunk is going to have. Like if you are releasing a game around there, delay it, push it for whatever, get away from them. Like mm -hmm. you're in trouble because that's all that anyone's going to be touching. There's, of course, there'll be pockets of people that are playing other things. Of course, there always is. You know, there'll be people yeah. who, um, but the what I what I mean is that it's going to command a hu like a huge chunk of the gaming community for probably a month, like no question. Like if you look at The Witcher Three, like that thing is still one of the top selling PC games on Steam in 2018, right? Like I'm pretty sure it's in the top 20 on Steam in 2018. It came out in what 2015, mm -hmm. like early 2015. In May. And Cyberpunk, yeah, it's not only is it going to be a fantastic game and probably it, like it is currently going to be my 2020 game of the year contender that will have to be knocked off. It doesn't even have to step into that point. It has to be knocked out of it. Um, 
yeah, it's going to be really, really rough for anybody that releases around then because that game's going to be really good and, and really and that po- did popular. Sort of happen with The Witcher Three uh, with Dragon Age Inquisition. They pushed back their release date. Well, not back, I guess forward. Uh, they made it earlier than it was supposed to be so that they wouldn't have to come out the year of The Witcher. So, and then they ended the up Witcher getting Game of the Year table. the prior year because they really didn't have much competition that year, honestly, uh, which was a smart idea for them, I think, but. They had to like and squeeze they, it into October. The Witcher Three set the table because for me, when I when I played The Witcher Three, I'd never played another Witcher game. I'd never played a CD Projekt Red, Red game. I had no idea what The Witcher was about. Anything. I never even played that kind of game. But I just decided I was going to give it a shot. Of course, part of that was for work as well. Um, and it's still probably the best game I've ever played, The Witcher Three. So there's a lot of people out there that are in that boat, right? Like they learned about CD Projekt Red and they saw The Witcher Three and how good it is. And now this is their next game. So the buy-in is going to be even bigger initially than it was with The Witcher 3. Like, it's going to be a more mainstream game than The Witcher 3 was at the time. Um, So I think that's what's going to be crazy. And this is all word-of-mouth stuff, right? Like, the game's out a week, and you're going to see all over Reddit how fantastic it is and all over, you know, just gaming websites. It's going to be all that anybody's talking about, and everybody's going to buy it. Oh, man, I'm staying away from the internet that week. I actually got spoiled really bad. Uh, when The Witcher 3 came out, because I was on Facebook and I saw some comments on on a picture, and it it ruined one of the the big things in the game for me. And it was I found all the endings <laughs> before I finished the game because I was doing guides for it, so uh, I knew like all the big decisions in The Witcher 3. I was aware of like what they were and where they were before I did them, and like what outcomes they resulted in. So, I, oh, luckily, man. I don't really mind spoilers, but yeah, Cyberpunk's gonna be a powerhouse and in every way imaginable like in everything if you're a player it's going to be a powerhouse in terms of popularity if you're a journalism it's going to be the only thing worth talking about that week if you're you know if you're a guides writer like me like enjoy the next two months of your life you know what i mean like that's it Mm -hmm. i just checked the release calendar as far as i can tell there's only one game that's anywhere near that and that's um actually somewhat of a similar game we'll talk about that in a little bit but uh i wanted to sort of close off our discussion of Microsoft Conference by having each of us pick one other game that we're excited about that isn't Cyberpunk. (laughs) Um, And to start it off, like the one thing that they showed very briefly was a a little announcement teaser trailer of Microsoft Flight Simulator. And I don't know what version that is now. Uh, They've dropped the numbering like they tend to do with so many games these days where they're just like, we're just going to start over. It's not going to be number 8 or 18 or 28. It's just Microsoft Flight Simulator. But it's coming out sometime next year. And I grew up on, like, my first simulation game of any sort, I'm pretty sure, was a Microsoft Flight Simulator way back when in, like, the early 90s or something. And it looked good. Like, I'm excited about it. So that that was another one that they showed, and I kind of made a mental note of, I want that. What about you, Joe? Something, something other than Cyberpunk that excited you from Microsoft. Sure, sure. They did yeah. mention a lot of games. A lot of games, yeah. And I think the Flight simu- Simulator looked awesome, too. So, good pick. I am really looking forward to Outer Worlds. And the thing that made it so very tantalizing was that the guy said it's not a huge, sprawling world. It's all about the culture of the planets and the dialogue. And it's going to be like a you know 30-hour experience. All about that. All about that. I am very intimidated by Cyberpunk. I most definitely will play it, but a little worried about the I just the got thing. sad about the Outer Worlds. Oh, no, that makes it so much better. It's just going to be like a tight, super well-crafted thing. So I'm really into that. By the better Fallout developer. <clears throat> <laughs> I can see the <laughs> appeal fair. of that. Though. Like so many games nowadays are open world, open-ended, you know, marry this game for the next six months. Right. And it, it, there's sort of almost a... For people who have busy lives, there's almost a relief that if you know that this game is not really short even, but concise, like it has a distinct ending and you will feel like you're done and you've accomplished it and you're not constantly like, oh man, I should go back there. I've got more things to do. Yeah. So. And I hope it's so good that I want to play it a second time and, you know, make it 60. I hope it is, you know, that kind of thing. But just knowing that it's not going to be this like side quest bonanza, that that's the thing that stresses me out. So I'm looking forward to that. What about you, Laren? Um, I think Bleeding Edge looked really cool. Uh, they ended up showing more gameplay after the fact, so uh, it was just, I think, the trailer during the, the conference. But that's the, the new game from Ninja Theory. And I just like the character models, the, the design of it. It looks really fun. 
Um, so I'm looking forward to that one, aside from Cyberpunk, if I have to pick. Is that the multiplayer? Yeah, yeah. It's like an or Overwatch or melee game from the Hellblade developers. Yeah, and um, they're they're pretty good with designing combat. So uh, the fact that it's a melee game, I find interesting, and so I, I I'm kind of interested to see how how it feels, how it plays. Um, I like fast paced, colorful stuff like that. So I think it's gonna be fun. Cool. And you, Bill, what else from Microsoft got your attention? I wouldn't have considered the Outer Worlds, but I guess I have to. Um, but I can't choose it now because Joe ruined it. Sorry. Um, just a note on that. See, I, I, I really dislike it when developers screw up open worlds. So I only look out there and see like maybe three to five open worlds that are worth being in. Um, so I was hoping Outer Worlds would be like that. But I guess whatever, 30 hours. But Microsoft Flight Simulator for me, um, it made me want to buy a flight stick. Um, it made me hope that it would have VR just for you because I'm not going to play it in <laughs> VR. But I thought if you can hook up your flight stick and a VR headset and play Flight Simulator, I will never see you again. Like you'll be gone because that's how up your alley that game would be. Well, like, here's hoping it has some sort of co-op mode then. Well, even if it doesn't, we're just going to be on Discord flying around, right? So yeah. it's going to work either way. But like uh, I, the thought of playing that with a controller or a mouse and keyboard, I felt dirty and had to shower. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm like crap like now i've got to buy that but i've got to buy a flight stick so or i've got to find somebody who needs a flight stick reviewed but one of the two <laughs> well okay we'll see how flight simulator comes out i mean it comes out in 2020 i'm sure we'll see lots more about it i'm just excited that microsoft is doing that again because it's sort of one of those hallowed kind of game series that have been around for a long time so that was interesting to me yeah all right so moving on to bethesda we're just kind of going chronologically through the pre-E3 conference weekend here. So Bethesda followed Microsoft in the evening on, on Sunday. And now I didn't get to see it live. I sort of skimmed through it after the fact. Um, and to me, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff really that I, I, I took away from Bethesda. They, they announced a couple of things, but nothing that really stuck to me. So I don't know who wants to who wants to dive into this. Like, Laren, you watched it, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that was... That stood out to you from Bethesda's press conference? Not really. I'm not. I'm not really huge into Bethesda stuff. I guess if I had to pick something that looked cool, I'd say Doom. Um, but you know, not really feeling like Elder Scrolls Blades or any of that. So it was kind of underwhelming for me. They did have Wolfenstein. I guess they had two of them that they uh, talked yeah. about, but they did. They didn't. Did they actually have anything brand new? Yes. Yes. What was that? Yes, they did. Ghostwire, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Two, two. Looks interesting. Your Ghostwire looks uh, looks really cool. Um, and uh, but the the internet is much more obsessed with the the lady that presented Ghostwire than it is Ghostwire, which I think is pretty funny. And I think it's pretty cool. Um, so the person, I think she was. I don't want to screw this up, so we're gonna have to fact check this. But um, I believe the lady that presented Ghostwire on stage was like one of the lead animation people for The Evil Within. Um, and right. that has people pretty excited because obviously, the, you know, the evil within had some pretty good animation. Um, so I'm really excited for Ghostwire. And it, listen, I'm the biggest Bethesda fanboy there is. Like I was making fun of Sam because Sam, like Xbox, you know, they fart rotten eggs and Sam's like, genius. That's amazing. Xbox is the best. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm like that with Bethesda. So I can't pick on them because I see Bethesda do anything and I'm just like, that's awesome. Like They're like, we're doing Battle Royale in Fallout 76. And I'm like, that is the smartest thing anyone has ever done, even though I hate Battle Royale. <laughs> um, so I, but I was underwhelmed by Bethesda. Uh, still a little bit butthurt over Fallout 76 in general, just being a bag of crap. Um, <laughs> but I appreciated that... Uh, I'm not going to stay mad for too long, but um, Ghostwire was for sure a highlight. But if I don't mention Doom Eternal, that looks awesome. Doom Eternal looks awesome. And I think we've, we've seen other bits of it and heard about it before, but Doom Eternal, I think, has game of the year contendership. Um, the gameplay in that looks absolutely phenomenal. So, uh, And I know that the multiplayer is being handled, I believe, in-house this time, which I think is a big deal because people were not happy with uh, the previous iteration's multiplayer. Um, and it was not handled in-house, I don't believe. So Doom Eternal, especially at Shack News, um, big Doom site. So looking forward to Doom Eternal, probably more than anything else at this point. Cool. From Bethesda, that is. Mm -hmm. What about you, Joe? Uh, Rump, uh, Bill, you were talking about, uh, I believe it's Ikumi Nakamura, right? And she is indeed, she was the lead art designer for The Evil Within and The Evil Within 2. 
and uh, Bayonetta, if I recall. Right. Which is uh, yes. yes, design concept. Yes, yeah. which is highly stylized. So she knows what she's doing. I think. Yeah, and she was. I mean, she, you're right. Like the internet kind of went crazy with that. You know, there was first there was Keanu, so there was lots of you know gifs and memes and stuff online about that. But then I I almost think that she might have stolen the the spotlight from <laughs> Keanu Reeves a little bit after after no her small presentation. Feet. Yeah, that's impressive. She was, uh, I think, objectively adorable in her uh, presentation. So it was nice to see like a non-jaded industry person. <laughs> she, there was she, a leg kick in there somewhere. Yeah, I something that like that. The, that's where everybody, that's where she won. Right. But it, like for me, like that's fine, right? Like her presentation and how everybody, you know, loved her presentation. That's great. But um, what I think is cool is that when people stop looking at her, you know, five minute presentation and then actually look at her work. It's like, oh, wow. Like, okay, Ghostwire is officially on the radar because she's a legitimate rock star at what she does. And that's going to be pretty cool. Totally. Not to mention a spooky, as she put it, um, action adventure games. Meaning something that I can actually play because I am very easily spooked and like I couldn't play The Evil Within. So it was good to hear that like this wouldn't be like a straight up horror game. So I thought, you know, good. I I can put this on my radar. Um, It does look interesting. We don't know how she have a a release date for this yet but it does it does look intriguing so I'll, I'll give you that like it does seem a little bit different than the norm i feel like a lot of the other stuff that bethesda had was you know they talked about fallout they they strangely talked a lot about uh how the gamers have shown them how they went wrong with fallout 76 and how they're working on making it better and like it was almost like an apologetic opening it was a little bizarre i thought yeah, this is the same company that, you know, starts banning people for, for whatever weird reason and then finds out, like, oh, they actually weren't cheating at all in the game. Oops. <laughs> or when people give feedback, they get upset about it. But now they're, like, really apologetic. Mm-hmm. I'm not buying it. Yeah, it was weird. I mean... Hard to buy it. It's PR. It's PR. You know. So I guess we can say that Bethesda was kind of lukewarm. It was a couple, one or two cool things. Less than lukewarm. But- I would say they sh- they shouldn't have been there is my it's my opinion but I think they were smart in the way they presented it though because the first half of their press conference was crap it was like okay <laughs> we were terrible at Fallout 76 and here's a mobile game and here's F- Fallout 76 Battle Royale and here's this and here's that and then it was like doom it's like okay at least they ended on the high note right Oh didn't um, they also have Commander Keen was that Oh that? man that looked bad uh, Yeah they did have that too Definitely yeah. marked off a bingo thing for me. <laughs> there were a few, uh, there were a few bingo squares filled with Bethesda's <laughs> yeah. press conference. But the funny thing is, and I don't say this as a fanboy, I say this overall. They objectively did not have a lot of great things to show. They had a couple great things to show. But if they hit the, if they hit it out of the park with Doom Eternal, it all will be forgotten, right? Like that. I feel like that's just the thing these days, right? Um, a company can lie, ban for whatever Larry saying. I don't know exactly what she's referring to, but I'm certain it happened. Um, and then they do one good thing and then everybody just forgets, right? Like enough time and one good story and then we'll all be over it and they'll be back in everybody's good books. Yeah. I could definitely see that happening. Yeah. And I mean, Doom is one of those classic, you know, titles that, that would have the, the pull to, to do that, to sway opinions or make you forget about some of the missteps that they've taken. If, if, if there's a, a series that can do that, Doom is one of those. And Wolfenstein to some degree as well. Um, all right, so no point going over what our favorite thing from Bethesda was that we didn't talk about already. Let's move on to Ubisoft. Um, actually, before that, to keep it chronological, on Monday morning, they did uh, upload VR, did their very first uh, VR showcase at E3, which was really just a series of developer interviews and previews and trailers and stuff and i just want to mention it briefly because i thought it was exciting to get some vr like dedicated vr coverage at e3 because there are some cool titles coming one that stood out to me is called aspire one vr operative that's coming sometime this year um which actually lets you play essentially as a as a spy in virtual reality um and there were a couple other titles shown as well it's weird the the spectrum goes from really cool and neat and i want to try this to boy that looks awful um so there still seems to be like a wide variety of um quality and and sort of presentation values in vr titles but i'm excited that it's getting its its time in the spotlight and obviously with oculus having new headsets just recently valve's index i think is starting to ship now to people who pre-ordered so that i hope that there'll be a lot more vr 
stuff coming in the future. And so that was nice to see. So I wanted to say kudos to uh, Upload VR for pulling that off. Now, Ubisoft, um, I, I feel like they, 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 they tried. So I, I, one of their big things was they got John Bernthal out on stage, who plays Cole D. Walker, who's the bad guy in Ghost Recon Breakpoint, which, Bill, you and I are, I would say, pretty excited about. We enjoyed Ghost Recon uh, Wildlands before, and this looks like more awesome co-op gameplay that we enjoy. But he went out on stage and he brought Bam Bam the dog, which I thought was just adorable, and talked a little bit about what's coming in Ghost Recon Breakpoint. But uh, aside from that, uh, what did you guys take away from Ubisoft? Why don't we start with Laren? Did they have anything that you were really excited about? Um, They had a couple... Th- well, so... They had Watch Dogs Legion, and I think yes. uh, normally I'm not super into the Watch Dogs games, but they are trying to go in a different direction this time uh, by allowing you to basically recruit and organize your own group of uh, underground people doing things, <laughs> tech things, uh, but trying to kind of overthrow the system. Um, but you can go up to pretty much any NPC and try to recruit them or play as them. And I think that's very ambitious of them. It should be interesting to see how that ends up working out. So I think that one was uh, the, the big game that sparked my interest from Ubisoft. Uh, Gods and Monsters kind of sounded interesting too. Um, not really too sure what it is though, because they didn't show a whole lot. Uh, but I guess it's from the people who made Odyssey, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, so yeah, that was also so interesting. that's that was interesting because it was uh, they kind of talked about this being like Assassin's Creed, but with a whole different art style and the whole sort of mythological angle to it, mm-hmm. um, and a little bit more whimsical. You know, Assassin's Creed has obviously been very you know, I mean, it's assassination, so it's somewhat dark. Um, this one seems like a more fun game, and it does look interesting. Yeah, it does. Uh, so those were the two for me. The rest of it was, I'm, I'm just kind of, eh, that, that's nice that they did that. Like, they have Roller Champions, uh, which hmm. they had a demo for, I don't know if the demo is still going on, but it was probably for like a week or so, uh, where people could try it out. And it's, it's like Roller Derby in a video game, and it, it looks like maybe they're trying to compete with... Um, uh, that soccer game. What is Rocket it called? League. Rocket League. Rocket League. <laughs> Thank you. That yes. soccer game. That Joe soccer just fell game. out of his chair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like losing, losing the words, but Ouch. yes, uh, definitely has the the visual appeal of that. So it looks like they're trying to sort of mm-hmm. compete with that. Um, could be fun. I don't know. It was just kind of like, yeah, that's cool, I guess. But that Watch Dogs it. Legion, by the way, is the one title that is somewhat close to Cyberpunk in that it has a release date of March 6th of 2020. Mm. Yeah, um, we'll all be and, over Legion by then, though. Well, and it's kind of... I, I can see a potential of... Because Legion is set in the future as well, and it's not quite Cyberpunk-esque, but it's a similar in a sense. It's very tech. You know, there's there's drones, there's, you know, obviously hacking into things, and so it's got a little bit of that angle. So I could see people very much uh, giving that a try and then being like, well, Cyberpunk's going to be so much better. Not oh, to say will, that yeah. the, the footage we saw was entertaining, though. I'll give them that. Um, they people are definitely as, going to compare the two. Yes. So you know, and on the flip side, you won't be able to play as an old grandma in Cyberpunk, I don't think. <laughs> or maybe you, you can. You don't know that. You can make your own character. So just make a grandma. <laughs> I don't think anybody will, but. No. That's a good point. <laughs> But it actually looked intriguing because, like you said, it is any NPC. So you don't really play one particular character. It's more like you play, you know, you build your resistance uh, from anybody that you meet on the street. And they all have different skills and abilities and backgrounds. Uh, So I'm curious to see just how well that turns out. I've said before that Ubisoft has gotten pretty good at building uh, sort of open worlds that feel alive. Like the the recent uh, Ghost Recon games and the Far Cry games have all been in my opinion, quite good as far as open world games are concerned. So having a world where every character is fleshed out and not just a random person that, you know, is there, but they all go about their own lives. They all have different things. Some people have, you know, uh, his- a criminal record history. And so they're they're going to be more likely to be detained longer if they get caught for crimes. And there's all these different things that must have taken a significant amount of work to do. So that sounds very interesting. And Joe, to your point earlier, this seems like the kind of game that has no ending. Or, you know, it would just take a very long time to see everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that mean you're not in on Legion, Joe? I am, I think, more cynical about Ubisoft than I am any other publisher. I love it. That's a good, uh, you just, you just set me up perfectly. I appreciate that. Because I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, 
I'm really excited for Legion, but I'm not stupid, which means that it's still going to be an Ubisoft open world game, and there will be aspects of it that feel very hollow. And I know this because that is every open world Ubisoft game that I've ever played. Um, and my comparison point would be uh, The Witcher 3, Fallout 4, Red Dead Redemption 2, and, you know, from what I have played, and it is a little bit of Breath of the Wild. Um, what they don't do well, Ubisoft, in their open worlds, and maybe this will change, is their use of space is not great. Um, and I judge this by how much I want to fast travel in your game. If I want to fast travel while I'm playing your open world game, you didn't do a very good job. But you because you you have not played the Assassin's Creed games in the last two years much, have you? I just played I played all the I played the entire but game. They're Odyssey, so man. good. It's I'm not saying it's not good. I'm saying that there's absolutely nothing to do while you're moving from point A to point B. That's the difference. When I'm playing Red Dead Redemption 2, I don't get to point B because there's so many things that I see that you know, get grab my attention. The same thing happens in The Witcher. There's so much happening um, with use of the space. It's not overwhelming because we've seen the overwhelming use of space by Ubisoft before in Far Cry Primal, where you couldn't go three feet without being in combat. And that was terrible. And I just feel like certain, like, think about Cyberpunk, right? Open world game, huge, intimidating to Joe. But here's the thing. They've spent what, Laren? How long have they spent making this game? Um... Probably longer than they did on The Witcher, so I'm guessing at least like five or six years now. Um, five or six years. It, it was announced way before that, but they probably didn't go all in until after The Witcher. They've was been done. making it since probably before the first um, Watch Dogs game came out. So Ubisoft made three open world Watch Dogs games in the time it took them to make Cyberpunk. You can't I'm, have that kind of detail. I, I really, I really want to argue this with you because you should because Cyberpunk. I feel like I feel like you have. And I'm not saying that you're necessarily wrong. And, and CD Projekt Red has got a very good reputation, and The Witcher 3 speaks for itself. But you have a lot of expectations of how cyberpunk will be in an open world sense that are purely based on CD Projekt Red's reputation. Well, um, I, can, I, can, I can eliminate cyberpunk from the conversation then. I can just argue it on The Witcher 3 or Red Dead or Fallout. But I would argue that the, the open worldness of the last two Assassin's Creed games is as good as The Witcher 3's. Oh no no Man. no no! Let's no. let's get this let's get this party going. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not no. That's not even. It's not even close, man. I Come don't on. think it's anywhere. Just close. Just being in the world, like the the point is, is that when Ubisoft pumps these things out, like they've got a framework and they're just plugging in the Lego pieces. Yes. Yeah, I think Whereas, they've gotten better at that. Um, but what I'm saying is that when you see a game like The Witcher Three or Red Dead, like Red Dead was. Grand Theft Auto came out in 2013, so it was five-year development cycle at least for Red Dead 2. Every inch of the world is done with intent. There's no, there's absolutely no, um, I'm trying to think of the right word here. There's no, uh, I guess, sort of like skimming over it. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's no parts of the world where they just pasted in a little bit of land that you had to traverse across. Like everything is on purpose with intent and with consequence. I don't find that in Ubisoft open world games. There's cool things, and I listen. I'm gonna love Legion. I'm gonna love it because I think the idea of being able to recruit anybody or play as anybody is genius. Oh yeah, and I'm not no delusion. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying specifically that Legion is gonna be great in that regard because I, I wasn't a big fan of the previous Watch Dogs games. I think I played the first one and it was okay. Um, so I'm not. I'm not saying that that is gonna be comparable to Cyberpunk. But I think in general, like if I had to pick one publisher that consistently does open world games in a way that I enjoy them, as in there is stuff I can do, there's stuff, if I want to do stuff, I can do it, I'm not constantly bombarded with nonsense and stuff, um, then Ubisoft, as a developer, is the one that's at the top of that list for me. Because even in Red Dead Redemption 2, and I love that game, but I have no desire to go back there. The online mode is a disaster, um, is completely pointless, and the few things that did work in that originally, they've somehow patched and broken or, or changed to the point where I don't want to do it anymore. So, like, there's a lot of things that I think Rockstar could have done with Red Dead, and they're not going to do because they've been so successful financially with GTA V that it's just going to be the same thing. Like, the, the content that's been coming out for Red Dead 2 has in no way made me want to go back and play it as far as the online stuff, which is really their entire focus now. 
So yeah, and I I don't disagree. I don't, I have no intention or desire to play Red Dead Online. On the other hand, Assassin's Creed Odyssey has been getting new content. They just got a whole new um, quest creator that from oh, even though from what I've read is fairly basic, but it lets people build their own quest lines with you know placing NPCs and characters and connecting dots and how everything goes together. Like there's a lot to do there, when, and it's one of those games on the top of my list that I wish I had more time for. Assassin's Creed tends to pop up well that but that's not my point though my point's not about returning because i just returned to red dead and i'm loving it but my point is about um the how, the detail that they create their worlds with and i find that ubisoft games don't have the same detail and the same immersion that i find in studios that sort of take their time and take well at least more time um ubisoft open world games are fun all of them now well, maybe not all but like most of them i have a lot of fun but there's a difference to me between an open world game that's fun, which is perfectly cool. You can, if you want the fun one, go play the fun one. But for me, I want the thoughtful one. And I find that it, it's not as thoughtful. That's where I'm sort of hung up on Ubisoft games. Okay. I think, I think we, I think that's, that's, fun. that's fair. Yeah. Thoughtful versus fun. Yep. Um, right. All right. So that's Ubisoft. They had a couple of other announcements. There's some new Rainbow Six content coming. There's a new Elite Squad mobile game. <laughs> Tom Clancy's Elite Squad. Was we there? We any... have to mention a couple more things about Ubisoft, or we're going to get torched. Okay, I was just going to say, what what is that? Yeah, I'm, I've got a, I've got a list open that I probably should have started talking about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> <coughs> Welcome to Sorry. the show, Bill. Um, yeah, yeah, right. So Rainbow Six Quarantine. Yes. Right. Mm, um, I don't know if we mentioned I it. I forgot about that. One. Yeah, the co-op. Right. Yeah. So that that seems like it's our bag, man. Um, we never got, and I say we, I mean the uh, the our typical trio, which is Bill, Dusty, and myself. We played. Did we ever play much Rainbow Six Siege? Maybe a little bit, right? We played for a while, but we never got into yeah, it quite as did. much as and some people a, do. They had some co-op stuff too, but it was it definitely wasn't the same level. Mm -hmm. um, and I love. I did really love Rainbow Six Siege. Um, I still do. I wish it's the one shooter I wish I played a lot more. The problem is, is that I'm terrible with a mouse and keyboard. I must play on PC and I cannot compete with a controller, so I'm screwed. Um, but quarantine looks like my thing, right? And it looks like our thing. Um, I'm trying to think of what else they had on here. I know there was some other stuff they did. Um, we talked about Watch Dogs Legion. Um, oh, you play Plus. We didn't talk about that. Yeah, speaking of the ever-growing list of subscription services, right. this is another one that I signed up for immediately. I, I don't know why. but You have an illness like me. It's okay. Well, to be fair, <laughs> it, and this, so this is their subscription service. Uh, I think it, it ends up being $10 a month, $9.99 a month. It starts in September. So if you pre-ordered, you get September free. as like a free trial. But basically, yeah, it's like a large chunk of the Ubisoft library for free. Similar to, I guess, Origin Access would be the closest comparison because that's EA's games and this is Ubisoft's games. Um, My only comments about it are that I'm going to buy it and that I get annoyed by monthly subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Like, it just, I'm just buying the year, man. I'm going to get so pissed off if I'm, like, looking... <coughs> sorry, just, just about died on podcast there. <laughs> I'm going to get so pissed off if I look at my like my my bank on on a monthly basis and see 28 subscriptions like it's got to be yearly or i can't do it fair enough uh, i think the one interesting thing that i took away from that is and i think somebody had predicted ubisoft doing a subscription might have been you even bill um but it's also coming to stadia and it, it opens up this model that google kind of talked about that you know there's stadia pro which is google's subscription service but they're positioning google stadia more as a as a platform Right. So you can actually Stadia Pro is a monthly subscription where you give your money to Google and they give you a certain number of games, certain variety of games that you can play stream on Stadia for free as part of that subscription. Now, Ubisoft will give you uh, their Uplay Plus, which can be on Stadia, and it's like a subscription on top of Stadia as well. So you can quickly see that we can very soon end up in the situation where, okay, I've got Stadia Pro, I've got Uplay Plus, which covers PC and Stadia. I've got Origin Access, which, you know, is for PC, maybe Stadia in the future. Then I've got the Xbox Game Pass, which is Xbox. Like, you got to start keeping a spreadsheet soon. Yeah, it's getting a little overwhelming. I'm sure that there's a spreadsheet on Reddit. We should look that up later on. <laughs> of all the possible subscription services, yeah. <laughs> see, it's this kind of stuff that makes me not want to buy any of them. <laughs> Because I my, just get too overwhelmed. Yeah, my sure. justification is don't. always that if if you spend, let's so say it's 120 bucks a year, just for simple math's sake, if you're going to buy two games from Ubisoft in a year, then you're good anyway. Yeah, right? I guess you'd have to math out how much you would be spending on them regardless. Yeah. 
Well, especially in Canada, right? Because 120 sounds about right in Canada. It could be 140, though, to be fair. Um, but two two games in Canada, and I'm talking standard edition, is 80 bucks each. So if you can, if you're going to, like, this is why I got Origin Access Premier, because I'll play, guaranteed, and I've done it historically over the last few years, I will play um, more than two Origin games or EA games a year. So I can easily buy that subscription and... It, it works out. Plus, they really do have a lot of other things in there that I want to play, um, and is, and a lot of add-ons and DLCs. But you do have to do the math on it. Microsoft is the one where I'm not entirely sure I'm getting my 200 bucks back in a year. Um, Ubisoft, I probably will, just because I'm as much as I just crapped on Ubisoft. I, I'm a sucker for their <laughs> games too. Come on, Bill. Well, I, I mean, there, I had there are corner. games other than open world games that we enjoy, like Ghost Recon. I just mentioned, like we're sure, definitely sure, playing sure. that when it comes out. In quarantine. In quarantine. So there's I think your two Joe games just took already. Exception to me though. We gotta. What was Joe? What? Joe was. Joe was about to put me in my place. Maybe. No, 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 not in your place. I just thought. I thought I had you in my corner. That's all I was saying. Oh, I mean, I bought it, so I guess I'm in the corner. I'm, maybe I'm, I'm just you. begrudgingly in the corner. I'm teasing you. <laughs> was there anything at Ubisoft, Joe, that uh, interested you? Uh, ro- roller champions, just for the Rocket League ness of it. But I, I played the demo on a on a friend's PC on a terrible friend's PC. So. I, I understand that it's probably not super representative. And the friend um, is terrible or the PC? Both, man. <laughs> this guy's the worst. <laughs> no, no, he's he's fine. Uh, he's a great friend. Is it Vin? It's Vin. <laughs> <laughs> he's got all a he's got a really lousy names. PC. Yeah. Really lousy PC. Um Was it no good then? Is that Well, like, I'm just saying I had a bad experience. I'm just I'm okay. I'm inclined to blame the the hardware. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, I don't know. I guess I, I so many games wanted to go after you know the top games it used to be that whatever game was the next world of warcraft killer then it was the next destiny killer then it was the next Fortnite killer like rocket league is kind of been unchallenged in whatever the genre is that you want to say that it's in yeah so and I'm not too surprised that someone's finally trying to take a, a slice out of that pie but yeah but what what you know my brief experience was that rocket league is just so painfully simple in its conceit and this is not quite that sort of level where it's just immediately understandable what you're trying to do. And that's why I think mm-hmm. Rocket League is so powerful. Yeah, it's very easy to get into, yeah. All right, so Square Enix was next up, and I'm going to stay with you, actually, Joe. Did you... I feel like there might have been one or two games at Square Enix, and they announced a lot of stuff that I didn't... Uh, that went right over my head. Sure, Except yeah. for one game. This but, is totally um, my jam, for give sure. Give us a recap. Okay, uh, Marvel... It couldn't be any less interesting to me. So I'll let you guys talk about that. Because that, that's like the <laughs> anti-Square Enix game. Like, it's almost weird that it's coming from It is from as non-Square Enix as a game can be, which is probably why it spoke to me the most for some reason. <laughs> and there was no Tomb Raider, which was the other thing. I had, I was hoping for more Tomb Raider. But Where, I thought I thought because this is a Crystal Dynamics joint that it was... It was a given that that Tomb Raider would be skipping, but you know I don't. Oh, know. see, I didn't. I didn't think that hard. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah, this is the Joe Show Final Fantasy VII remake. Um. I mean, that's totally up my alley. I like. I. I don't need to repeat myself, but Final Fantasy XV made me a believer in this sort of like hybrid combat that they've concocted. I think it's fun. I really do, and I think this looks really slick, and I'm looking forward to playing it. Um. Final Fantasy VIII remastered. That. That sort of stuff, like, that's my... You guys are talking about, or at least, Jan, you're talking about, like, these, like, quick triggers, like, yep, gonna buy that, yep, gonna buy that, signing up for that subscription. When, Whenever I hear these Square Enix, these old-ass games that are, like, from the late 90s that are coming to the Switch, I'm like, hell yeah, I'm like, insta-buy, hell yeah. Um, so, for whatever reason, that's my weakness in Final Fantasy VIII coming and joining, like, this, like, vast lineup of Final Fantasy games. I'm all about that, you know. I'm a sucker for that. What can I say? But I mean, it's it's clearly targeted at the type of gamer that you are as well, right? Like they know who enjoyed it back when it was first out and they're giving you exactly what you want. Yeah. There's also that completionist thing that like, I, yeah, I want to play the entire discography, the entire catalog of Final Fantasy on one console. Like, thank you for challenging me to do that. Um, so there's, there's, I know that I'm not the only one that feels that way. There's something, there's so, something almost like, like I said, like a challenge, like, there you go. They're all there on the system. Play them all and like make it like a life event. <laughs> you know? So uh, I I just I just like that. And it's sort of like a like I said. It's just it's just you know my childhood coming back to me. I guess. Um, on top of that, the Last Remnant remastered launching during the stream for twenty bucks on the Switch. It was just hard to say no to that. Kind of like a cult 
cult classic, like a sort of a low low seller on the 360 about 10 years ago that they brought back. I've been playing that this week a bit, and uh, it's definitely like an interesting version of an RPG. It's it, it is in that sort of like 360 era where um, these developers that were making RPG JRPGs for years and years were trying to like twist up the formula a little bit. Um, and this is like a like sort of like a relic from that era, even though it was only 10 years ago. And it, it has some interesting twists because I think it's, you know, of that kin. But, uh, you know, I don't think there's, there's nothing ground uh, groundbreaking, earth shattering going on during the stream that like, you know, had me like super stoked besides uh, Final Fantasy VII be, since it is coming pretty soon. Um, but at the same time, it had that sort of like dull burn of like pretty interesting t- for my specific interests, like nothing crazy, but I was happy to see, you know, those smaller releases that are going to be trickling out. Were you uh, not into Outriders at all? Uh, again, much in the same way, Marvel doesn't seem like a Square Enix thing. This is almost just like using Square Enix for their publishing empire, as opposed to like really fitting in with the SE demographic. But I, I, we could, I don't know if it's going to be good or bad. I have no opinion of it. We could get psychologists to do a study on human beings, behavioral, and uh, what they think of various parts of Square Enix press conferences. Because <laughs> whereas you're like, you know what? As a Square Enix fan who likes most of the things they do, I had no interest in Marvel. I'm like, I agree with you. And then you're like, yeah. And Outriders kind of landed in the same you know, boat as Marvel. I'm like, I completely disagree <laughs> with you. But I also have no interest in Final Fantasy. Sure, sure. Um, I have- it's just weird. And then I think... You know, Jan is probably the opposite, where he's, you know, way into the Marvel thing. But Well, it kind of just speaks to the oddness of this publisher, where they don't have... Like, Ubisoft just has this, like, malaise of Ubisoft over everything that they do. And maybe that's my, like, maybe I'm putting that on them, but I just feel that way about anything that starts with that logo, I'm like, yeah, that feels about right. That feels Ubisoft. Square Enix has sort of like this weird disparity between some of the stuff they put out. It doesn't have, they don't have that like Square Enix-ness as much as Ubisoft has their Ubi-ness. Yeah, however you say it. they have a little more variety. They're a little bit more generic. You can definitely tell that in some of these games, they're merely serving as a publisher, right? right? Yeah. Um, it's almost like Microsoft in a smaller way where, you know, like th- there's certainly some Microsoft titles that are very Microsoft, or Xboxy, right? Um, and then there are other ones that are just okay. Well, it's just a game that you know Microsoft publishes, right? Yep. And it's not just Ubisoft. Just so that I could be fair, like Bethesda's got that like hyper masculine, like grunting gameplay thing going on. Like, I think it's normal for a publisher to have a shtick, uh, and Sony certainly does. Yeah, like <laughs> really super hyper dramatic with sweet ass visuals and thirty frames per second. <laughs> yeah, that's their thing. <laughs> yeah, <And> exactly. <laughs> they knock that's it out a of the park. Wonderful still picture, Sony. I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, but they kill it. They know what they're doing. 30 frames per second in 2019. <laughs> Just being honest, it's still good. I'm all about it. Looking forward to last year. I agree. Very beautiful 30 frames. Pisses me yeah. off. Yeah. I, anytime I go from, like, this happens to me all the time. I'll be quick. I'll play on PC for a couple months and won't touch my PlayStation. People, Some people think I'm a PlayStation fanboy. I'm not. I do like their exclusives, but I am constantly angry at Sony's hardware and the lack of uh, frames. Um, so I'll play on PC for a couple months in 2K and, you know, I don't know, 144 frames per second on ultra settings. And then I'll go play even Red Dead. And I'm like, I'm nauseous. I just, it takes me about an hour before I can play it without feeling nauseous. I have to get used to it again because I'm not used to like leaving all those frames behind. Poor frames. (laughs) Won't someone think of the frames? No frame left behind. What about you, Laren? Was there something at Square Enix that you... That we haven't talked about yet? Haven't mentioned? No. I'm, I mean, there was... <laughs> Not for me, I, I mean. Yeah. You mentioned, Joe mentioned Marvel's Avengers, which I, I don't know quite what to think about yet. I mean, I, I really enjoyed all the Marvel movies and stuff like that. I'm not a big Marvel comic book fan. Like, some people can tell you the history of why this Spider-Man is better than that Spider-Man, and I'm like, there's two Spider-Man? What's going on? Um... So, like, you know, our friend Dusty is, you know, he knows, like, the origin stories of, of everything. and I don't, but I, I, I'm kind of intrigued by the idea of playing a sort of co-op looter shooter type game with friends. Even though I've heard something the other day that made me question that I'm not sure how, how much co-op there actually will be in this Avengers game. So, time will tell. It's it's very early. Um, didn't they it, say that something like the main campaign was a single player? Thing? Yeah, which... Put a damper on it for me, but yeah. I, again, like I don't, I don't know how much of that is 
going to come to fruition and how much of it is going to change and, and whatnot. To me, it was just one of those games that like, that looks kind of interesting. And I had put something on my bingo card that said it was going to be terrible. And I didn't think it was awesome, but I didn't think it was terrible either. It was that's kind of how, that's how I felt about it. Like, I'm not super into Marvel stuff, um, but the gameplay did look fun. And to me, that's what matters. And uh, I don't know, I, we have to see more of it. It's hard to make a judgment, I think. Um, but I'm not completely ruling it out yet. Right. Do we have anyone on the line that's into Kingdom Hearts? Because I'm not, but I know that they have a DLC coming out, and Kingdom Hearts is a pretty big deal. Yeah. Well, I would assume Joe, if anybody. You're right. You would assume that it's me, but no, that's not me. <laughs> too, well, too whenever there's something where I'm like, this is, doesn't interest me at all, it Joe probably loves it. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't love like I don't love like the hyper fast actiony RPG scene so much. Okay, fair enough. But Laren, were you going to so, say that you like it? No. No, no. Okay. All right. <laughs> no. so, sorry to uh, any Kingdom Hearts fans. <laughs> How dare you? Congratulations yeah. to listeners who like Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> but see, uh, you've got. We're not with you. It's one of those games, and there's several others um, that are, whether they're being remade or have a sequel coming after many years, a lot of those games uh, draw on the heartstrings of players that really loved the original or whatever game they was that they played when they were a kid or younger or 10 years, 15 years ago. So I feel like a lot of these games are purely marketed at those people, and Definitely. there just happens to be none of those on this roundtable at the moment. That doesn't mean that it's not a huge success with you know people who were totally into that oh, yeah. 15, 20, whatever years ago. Yeah, it's a big success. And so, you know, like, I mean, uh, Bill, if, if 15 years from now there will be a remake of The Witcher 3, you're going to, I don't know what you're going to do, but probably concern your wife so you're going to be all over that no i'll just call Laren. Laren, they're doing it <laughs> i'll flip a table like you cannot yeah. remake this game <laughs> i mean or it would be quite the challenge i think i don't think yeah, they would do I'm that i'm more though. interested in seeing the witcher 4 yeah but that's a that's a ways away yeah that would be that would be more of the table flip as if they decided not to do another witcher game but then remake an old one i think now i do have to hijack the podcast very quickly kind of like the bus in speed oh with boy. Keanu. Very nice. And ask Laren, oh boy. what is the other game that they are supposed to be releasing? CD Projekt Red. If I'm, did I get this right? They're releasing another game before the end of 2020. Uh, they did say that, right? Am I crazy? Did uh, I dream this while I was ill? <laughs> um. Yeah, you might still be sick. I don't know. Uh, can we? Well, can we get a fact check? Right, fact there? Yeah. <laughs> if there's another game they're Typing making, feverishly. I'm, not, I'm not aware of it. Yeah. But the uh, the creative director that. did say that they want to go back and explore the witcher world again so i know for if i know they're working on something um I'm sure I, they're working so on something. this was uh, so the only thing i found now this was an article from march of this year that cg project red is working on two triple a titles by 2021 mm, right. yeah they did say that but we don't we have no uh, idea what that means so by 2021 though it's a mystery but no it's not gwent Throne Breaker, so yeah. it's not oh that. God. It's not the we're, assume, game. we're assuming Cyberpunk is one of those two games. So yeah, yeah, yes, you would they think so. have one other one, but what that could be, nobody knows. See, I'm Siri. You know, if it was a like, I'm way more excited about a Witcher Four than about Cyberpunk. I want to see wanna Siri know. and Cyberpunk. That's what I want. Yeah, see. that's what I was going to ask you right now. Wait, what? Uh, we just <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for real. Um, no, Siri and Cyberpunk, dude. Yeah. Okay, you missed it then. In The Witcher Three, there's actually a conversation which opens the door that she could be in Cyberpunk. No, I'm yeah. not saying that it can't happen. I just don't. Why? Why? Because it's Siri. <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm actually giving you a look right now like <laughs> i know i know you are um okay <laughs> i don't know I've, I've just we've had this discussion many times before where i'm like all about uh elder scrolls and bleh on anything fallout related and i'm a little bit like that with the witcher 3 like the fantasy setting sword armor horses and cyberpunk genetic things i'm like eh. that, that's just i mean me. it does make it does make sense um like, they didn't have to stretch to make it work, if they did it. That's what I'll say. Like, it actually does work with the story. So It does. Uh, let's not even, I don't even want that brain aneurysm you're trying to give me. I'll, I'll tell you later on Slack when you have no choice, but yeah, we can continue on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the last major conference was Nintendo, and I think there was probably a fair bit of stuff um, announced there, maybe? They certainly l sort of ended all the press conferences with, with quite a bang, and I don't know if we want to start with that. I believe they had more than 30 release dates. There was a lot. Um, yeah. And, you know, it was one of their you know, pre-recorded Nintendo Direct type things, which honestly, uh, you know, as much as I enjoyed the surprise of 
Keanu Reeves on the Microsoft stage. Um, I totally understand why publishers are more and more going to these pre-recorded things. Like, here's all the facts. There's no screw-ups. There's no weird, awkward moments. You know, it's just there, facts, details. This is what's coming and when. Boom. People get excited. They do it really well. Mm -hmm. Um, And other people are now trying to emulate that. And no no one's doing it as well as as Nintendo. Well, they have arguably the most practice. They've been doing this for the longest. Like, as far as doing pre-recorded Nintendo Direct, like they're the ones that started that all. Everybody else is starting to do that now too. But yeah. um, so I mean, so what they ended with, we'll start at the end of their press conference, I guess, was the announcement that they are indeed working on a, a Breath of the Wild sequel. Um, they showed a little bit of a teaser trailer, which I mean, first of all, I don't think it comes as a surprise to anybody that they're making a sequel. It would just be ignorant to assume that they're not. So, but um, I, I can't speak too much on it because I haven't finished the first game yet. Yes, I've started playing it, Joe and Bill started playing it good but um joe why don't we start with you i mean you obviously finished the first one or played the first one what did you think about the announcement or the reveal that they're working on a sequel uh what i think well i like you said like it's a just sort of a no-brainer but uh my impression of what little they did show the little you know cinematic teaser it just you can't help but say like ooh, this is the majora's to breath of the wilds uh ocarina of time like it seems like the we're going to do the same assets we're going to remix things maybe twist the formula a little bit the way majora's did and it's going to be darker right like it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be the dark night um yeah it does seem to be sort of sort of like a direct continuation ish like they're you know, it's not that. a complete it's not a revolution it's an evolution yes and it certainly is the same art style uh which is evident immediately so yeah i mean that's exactly what happened with Ocarina and Majora's, right? They, they, it was like the same engine, same asset pack, reused a bunch of stuff, but they twisted it in just the right way that it was like super interesting. You didn't feel like you were retreading. So I'm hoping, and, and I'm, I'm confidently knowing that, you know, they, they know how to pu- pull off a sequel. It's not going to be Watch Dogs 2. It's going to be Zelda, you know, it's going to be a Zelda sequel, which means it's going to be awesome. I'm not, I'm not even the biggest Zelda guy, truly. Just uh, have faith in this particular thing. You know who we need to have on the podcast to talk about Zelda? Sure. Asif. Yes. We definitely do. Um, I'm going to make a commitment right now. Be- and this is, this is uh, I, I know uh, I know that uh, Asif listens to us. Um, he's probably a little bit behind because he's been trying not to die at E3. But um, I will finish Breath of the Wild before the sequel. I'm committed. Because <laughs> that's, that's pretty generous of you. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've had a lot of time to finish it already and have it. It's true. So it's not yeah. as if I'm, yeah, right. And I hear about it. I hear about it rightfully so from him uh, every couple months. Um, but I will. And the thing is, is I want to. That's that's the thing. I want to. But I do need to. And I might do this this evening just so I can get it done. I need to hook my switch up to a monitor. Um, handheld mode for a game that is going to take me, you know, 50 to 100 hours isn't, isn't going to cut it for me. Um, whereas a lot of people travel and they're on the go. I'm not. Right, I don't want to sit in my backyard playing on a handheld. Right, I have all this nice monitors and crap, and I want to use them. So, um, so that's that's what's going to get me to to play Zelda. Um, but we do need to have him on, and I agree. I the thing I want to say about Nintendo is that I'm not the biggest Nintendo guy. Obviously, there's a lot. There's people that are way more into Nintendo than me. But that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate everything that they do. I I think that they are at the top of their game. Um, I think that they probably beat up on most people at E3 with their announcements and their games. Um, and I can say that just objectively without necessarily being the kind of person that's going to have to play all of those games. Like some of them don't interest me, but I can appreciate the quality that they're, they're serving up at the same time. Um, I thought they did a fantastic job. Luigi's Mansion. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm trying to think like, there's so many announcements that I'm trying to keep up with. Obviously the Zelda sequel, but the thing that... I'm wondering, Joe, did you ever play The Witcher 3? Sure. Oh, yeah. You did? Oh, okay. Never mind. I was going to say, because if you hadn't, then the Switch was going to give you an opportunity. No way. I, that's not the way to play that game. But It's not, but I was trying to you know, bring it to your level for you. But. Yeah. I mean, it struggled a bit on the PS4 Pro. Um, so but here's the question. struggles a bit on the PC. Are, are you going to buy it on the Switch? No. I no, mean, I don't mean you. Sorry. I mean Bill, because Bill buys everything Witcher really. Oh, oh, oh. It comes with a map. Oh, yeah. And a stickers in a box i will buy it on the switch um i'm actually hoping that my wife will play it but i don't think that's going to happen it's just not her thing but i think if she ever allowed herself to get five to ten hours into it it would definitely be her thing 
she just i don't think she could ever you know be engaged in the early hours enough to uh to get there yeah fair enough so i mean yeah so that was obviously an announcement that it's coming to the to the switch at some point yep i was Um, wrong about it what about empire of sin did anybody pay any attention to that i thought it looked interesting i didn't get to see too much of it but it's um it's not your typical nintendo game yeah, I think uh, I think it's going to be pretty cool, and I I kind of like how um, there was a, there was an interview on um, on on Shack News at our E3 booth, and right now I'm drawing a blank as to who did this, but I believe I wrote the article for this interview, but I I've written so many that I can't remember who it was, but um, there was a a, um, a developer talking about bringing their game to Nintendo Switch, and they were commenting about how. Um, it, their game's not very Nintendo. Oh man, it's it's a big game too. Death by Daylight. That's what it was. That's coming to Switch, right? Um, and I think that it's coming is to as, other as platforms. non-Nintendo esque as you can get. That's the <laughs> that's the point though, and that's where Nintendo's doing really well. Not just where they're doing really well, but one of the places they're doing really well is that you always thought of Nintendo as like having this identity, the same way that Ubisoft and Sony and Bethesda and all them did. But Nintendo is also allowing games that you would never expect to be on the Nintendo Switch on the Nintendo Switch. And by that doing that, they're opening it up to people who, like myself, I'm not a huge Nintendo guy. There's some things I like and there's things I've played as a kid like everybody, but I'm not like falling all over myself to play every Nintendo game that comes out. Um, but games like that are what will help bridge the gap for me and will bring me more towards the Nintendo Switch. And then, you know, I think that's the point. You know, you get there and then, oh, hey, maybe I do want to try this uh, this Nintendo game or the Nintendo game. So they're not just appealing to the Nintendo fans anymore, which is cool. Yeah. Um, let's pick a favorite from the Nintendo conference, if we can. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with mine, just so that you guys have a second to adjust to the curveball. It's not really a curveball, but... Um, the one title that I actually saw at Nintendo that I'm somehow most excited about is Mario and Sonic at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Um, <laughs> and the reason for that is it reminded me of playing, I don't know which, but it, some game when I was a kid that was about the Olympics. So it had all the Summer Olympic sports. There was a Winter Olympic one as well. I don't even remember what system it was on. Probably a Nintendo, like a Super Nintendo or something. Um, but it was fun going through all the different competitions and 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 skills and stuff like that at the Olympics. So when I saw this, I was like, ah, that's what I want to play on my Switch. Like, that seems like fun. Yeah. That's to me when I think, and you know, this may be my own bias, and you just talked about how Nintendo is growing and expanding what kind of games are on the Switch. But to me, that's still like wholesome, fun Nintendo Switch type game that I want to play. What about you, Laren? Uh, I'm really looking forward to Luigi's Mansion 3. I thought that looked really fun. Uh, they have some added mechanics uh, to make it more interesting. But I, I like all the games that have like environmental puzzles and things like that. And so mm. I'm looking forward to that one. That's also why I really love the Zelda series, or franchise, I guess. Um, but unfortunately, I never played Breath of the Wild, which I'm still kind of like upset at myself about because I don't own a Switch, and I need to get myself a Switch one of these days. Uh, but as soon as I get one, I'm, that's like the first thing I'm playing is Breath of the Wild because I, I want to keep up with where that whole franchise is going. And now that they have a, a sequel coming to Breath of the Wild, like I want to be be there with everybody, I guess. Well, uh, if if you ever get a Nintendo Switch and I ever finish it, then and if Joe is okay with it, I'm willing to pass along the, will, uh, will, 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 the Breath will. of the Wild game <laughs> that Joe sent to me. And I'm, I'd be happy to send it on to you. <laughs> I will gladly take it. Uh, yeah, I, I really. I like that you're happy to give away Joe's stuff. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, actually, Joe and I, we never really talked about if you wanted it back when I was finished or not. Oh hell yeah, I want it back. But yeah, it can make a pit stop. Maybe at, it could take a, a detour through. Are you kidding? Do I want it's it okay. back? I, I no, no, get, La- La- I Laren, I want, I want you to play it, but then I want it back. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might just get my own then because I'd want to keep it. Um, Amen. But I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, on that note, I also think Cadence of Hyrule looks really great it's actually out now it came out like two days ago i think oh yeah um and that one merges crypt of the necro dancer with zelda like the like hyrule you're in hyrule but your game mechanic is that of crypt of the necro dancer so it, it's this rhythmic game where you move to the beat of of the music and they remastered all or remixed i guess all of this zelda music for the game uh, and you're replaying 
a whole Zelda game with this mechanic of like moving to the beat, swinging to the beat, and and fighting everything that way. And I just think it looks so cool. Um, so I wish I could play that. I wish I had a Switch. Uh, all these things look really good to me. So um, and Animal Crossing looks interesting too. I never played the old ones, but it's the kind of game that I see myself like getting really sucked into with just like really menial tasks like rearranging my furniture or you know farming and and stuff like that. Like I I get sucked into those kind of games for whatever reason which i guess is the point so that was actually one that nintendo spent a little bit of time on talking about because they've delayed it until next year and they basically talked a little bit about making sure that their you know their developers and employees have a good work-life balance and essentially saying like we don't want to incur this whole crunch thing too much here Mm -hmm. so we're we're going to delay animal crossing until march 2020 wow i love that right before cyberpunk yes but that's I don't there's think not exactly not a lot of the crossover. same audience. Like you can no. probably do both at the same time. <laughs> and yeah. if anybody is, yeah, Nintendo can do Nintendo. Right. They don't. They don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Like if I was, if I was another, you know, uh, like a, a big console game, like a, P, I'm talking PS4, Xbox One, or PC or something like that, I would be concerned. But Nintendo can Nintendo, and everybody needs to just steer clear. So. Yeah, it's one of those things where I'm going to have to really like partition my time accordingly during those months. Make sure that I'm giving games like their equal uh, attention. I guess. Yeah, it's, I need to get a switch it's all first. About so planning I guess that's now. Fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got to schedule when to play our games. Mm. All right, Joe. Uh, what about you? What was your favorite Nintendo announcement? I hate to do this, but I have three like equal, <laughs> equal footing ones. <laughs> that's fine. That, Go ahead. All right, Le- Luigi's Mansion Three looks great. Links Awakening. Gotta mention Gooigi, by the way. Just yeah. Like, they showed that was so cute. And of course, I mean, Luigi, Gooigi, like it's so, it's so Nintendo. Uh, it's great. Yeah. Very good idea. Good, good co-op mechanic, it looks like. That's cool. Um, Link's Awakening looks really good. I think it's beautiful. And uh, it's a great way to play a Zelda game that I've never played that people seem to quite like. And... Um, I know it's going to be so bad because it's like a like a TV show tie-in and those are 100% always bad. But I'm a sucker for tactics and that Dark Crystal Netflix tie-in tactics game, for some reason, I keep looking it up. I'm just kind of interested and I want to see what it is. I know it's going to be bad. <laughs> it's going to be bad. <laughs> Which What's it called? The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance Tactics. Oh, okay. I, I like, must have missed that completely because the the only TV tie-in I remember is that um, the thing that Ubisoft revealed with um, Laren. You wrote about this. Um, forget the guy's name from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Oh mm-hmm. yes, doing it. Uh, yeah, Mythic Quest. Yeah, yes, Mythic Quest. doing a TV show where he plays the creative develop creative director of the studio making it. There's um, one. There's one funny moment, and I didn't really I didn't really love that that whole reveal in general. But I think they. I think they called like the upcoming DLC of Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet, and I think that's such an incredible title. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the full name of the the show is Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. All right. Uh, I, I don't know. Good. I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, that looks. It looks like it could be funny. I don't know. Uh, what bums me out is that it's like only available on what Apple TV Plus. I don't. Yeah. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I don't oh have it. yeah, it's one of Apple's new. It's like their Netflix it's an, thing. It's another yeah. thing we're gonna have to buy. Yep, add it to yeah. the list. <laughs> so I feel like that was kind of a bummer. Put it on the spreadsheet. Read it. I'll be there later. <laughs> and they said it so quickly too during the reveal. Like only available on Apple TV Plus. Okay, here it is. And then mm. <laughs> like we weren't supposed to notice that it's like pretty much nowhere except for this one platform. <laughs> so I I'm kind of like Joe. I've got more than one, but for different reasons. And the reasons are I tend to get more excited about other people's reactions to things. So when I saw Microsoft Flight Simulator, I was excited, but I was more excited for Yawn. Um, Like when I see Cyberpunk, anything new about Cyberpunk, I always think about like, hey, how excited is Laren gonna be, right? Like I'm excited too, but I also think of people that are really gonna dig this stuff and I'm, you can't wait to hear their reactions because I just like genuinely seeing the joy that people get from their favorite things. So for me, Zelda has to be at the top but yes, I want to play through Breath of the Wild, and then I want to play the sequel. But I'm more excited to hear Asif talk about the sequel. That's that's for me is I'm more excited for him because I know how much he loves the, the series. So that's Zelda for me for that. Um, 
otherwise, I mean, I'm really excited for The Witcher 3 on Switch, but for no one in particular, just hopefully that a bunch of people that maybe have never experienced it um, will now try it and love it. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that um, it's exposed to some folks that just, you know, never had the opportunity before. Um, other than that, I think for myself personally, it's probably Luigi's Mansion 3. Um, that's what I'm most excited about just to play. Just looked fun. Looked like the kind of thing that I would enjoy. It does. Yeah, there's lots of lots of great content coming really out of all of these uh, conferences. I, you know, perhaps with the exception of Bethesda, I wasn't as enthused about some of their stuff. But for the most part, I think uh, everything, you know, it's it's a gamer's Christmas, right? You get to look at all the cool stuff coming, and no matter what your style is or your favorite genre is, there's, there's usually something to get excited about. So we did our E3 bingo cards earlier, and one of the reasons I wanted to make sure that we had Laren back again for this one is because now that we know what happened, we got to try to mark off squares that we got right. And what I think we should do is just go around the table and find out if anybody did get a bingo and what those things were. And then I'm actually most interested in some of the things that didn't happen. So I don't know, maybe Joe, do you want to start? I could start. What what am I exactly starting? You well, wanna, I didn't get let a bingo. us know. You did not get a bingo. Not okay. even, cl- not even friggin' close. <laughs> so then, what I'm most interested in is in something that didn't happen that was on your card, like one of your predictions that didn't come true. That you're that is most significant, like hmm, like yeah. one that I really, really thought. <sighs> yeah, you really thought this was going to happen, or you really wanted this to happen, and just nothing. Uh, probably fa- like a fable game coming from the Horizon devs, mm-hmm. um, the Forza Horizon devs, rather, because that was like that was like really like pretty well documented as like almost a given like, it came up a lot right yeah uh, so and i had that on my car too and i almost thought like should i put this on i feel like it's so guaranteed to happen <laughs> exactly yeah yeah um one i was disappointed about is final fantasy 7 remake i thought they were ditching the episodes and just putting the game out and i was wrong about that they're sticking with the episodes that's actually a good point right like the release date is not that far off but it's only for what the first episode first episode which they say is like absolutely enormous and like you wouldn't even think of it as being like a short game like it's just a full ass game so it's not a big deal it just uh you would like to get the whole experience at once obviously but you know i'll take it um let's see what else did i have on here that is semi you know metroid prime trilogy that was also like pretty uh i don't know pretty popular in the like given column maybe not given but it was it was considered likely and it you know we didn't get that Yep, I think that's that's true. There's with all the leaks we had before, there were some things that seemed so guaranteed to be announced and then just didn't happen, which was yeah disappointing for probably for a lot of people who were really looking forward to those. Yeah, that would have been good. Mm-hmm. What about you, Bill? How's the bingo card looking? Well, I didn't get bingo. You got um, close though. I remember you. <laughs> I did, and man, I got ripped off too. <laughs> I got ripped off hard. So I was one away from a bingo. And I was only close on one line. Um, I, I made a lot of predictions that just turned out to be complete opposite. Like, uh, for example, I predicted a new Far Cry game. Nope. Microsoft continues to underwhelm. Nope. Um, I said we will not see a new Rainbow Six game. <laughs> yep. Uh, what else did I do? I said Ninja will do something that annoys Scanner, and it was Dr. Disrespect. So, you know. Yeah. Um, but the things I got right on the line where I almost got bingo, I, I predicted Doom Eternal would get a release date. I don't know if that was known that it was going to happen. Um, I predicted that John uh, Bernthal would uh, appear at Ubisoft. It felt like something that Ubisoft would do. I don't know if that leaked, but I didn't hear it. That's a good prediction. Um, yeah, I thought that was. I thought that, that was probably the one that I was the most proud of, to be honest with you, because I felt like it could go either way. But it seemed like an Ubisoft move, so I was kind of. You know, that's your big star. He's legitimately a big star. You're going to want to roll him out. Um, I re- predicted Nintendo will announce a new game service or device or game that creates maximum hype. And they did that, of course. That was that was my that was literally the center of my card because I knew that I would get it right. Didn't matter what it was. I knew I would get it. Um, and I also predicted the Outer Worlds would get a release date and it would be this year. What I missed This is where I miss Bingo, and this is the biggest punch in the gut to miss Bingo on. Todd Howard will swear at least once during the Bethesda showcase, and he didn't. I was, of all the predictions I made, I was rock solid on that. He swears every year. Every year he swears. Nope, not this year. Well, this was a a different, more gentle Bethesda. 
Well, they had a lot of swearing. It just wasn't Todd. <laughs> it just wasn't Todd. I know. <laughs> I almost want to go back and watch it again and just see if I can maybe like hear him mutter it under his breath or something. I don't know. Rats. Does <laughs> but, that count? Yeah. Is that swearing? <laughs> no, it doesn't. He's an F-bomb guy. I would have taken uh, I would have taken an F-bomb and not much else, honestly. All right. Well, But it didn't happen. That's a, that's a bummer to, to miss out on that. What about you, Laren? How did your bingo card turn out? Um, well, I almost got bingo in a few spots, but uh, had I thought about the placement of some of my squares, I think I definitely would have had a bingo. I just didn't lay it out properly. <laughs> uh, but, you know, my, my digital imaginary dauber has marked a lot of the squares. Just not enough to get a bingo. Um, so some of the stuff I didn't get was... Baldur's Gate 3 gameplay. I thought they were going to show a little bit more since they had just revealed it, or teased it, a few days prior. Um, but we didn't really get any gameplay as far as I know. And Splinter Cell announcement, that didn't happen either, um, unfortunately. And then some of them I shouldn't have even put on my card, stuff like Ghost of Tsushima release date, because where would they have announced that? <laughs> didn't have Sony there. Uh, same with like more Last of Us Part 2 gameplay. Like I could have just deleted those squares and put something else there. Or, or well, it would have been around. great if it came true. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, uh, for the most part, I got a lot of other things, though, like Animal Crossing footage. We got that. Uh, I think Joe and I both got the fancy car to promote Forza. Yeah, car? but I said you real just... car, and I don't know if that was a real car. <laughs> oh, you actually I... said real car? <laughs> I did say real car. That may have been just like a Lego car. I don't know. I think it was. I think it was just all Legos. Wasn't all it? Legos, so then I'm wrong. I d yeah. <laughs> Well, we were wrong on our predictions of the type of car. Well, for sure. Yes, for sure. <laughs> but I'm still counting it on mine, because mine says a fancy car to promote next Forza. <laughs> oh, no, see, that's technically wrong, isn't it? Well, it, it was fancy. Because it wasn't for the next Forza, uh, it was the current one. Listen, I'm willing to give you that one. That's, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure, I'll it. take it. I'll, yeah. I'll take it. Not that I have a bingo anyway, so I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and we got the, the Cyberpunk 2020 release date. I think all of us got that. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. I did not get that. Oh. Because you said you didn't say 2020. You said release window or something, not a specific date. Yeah, I, I said, uh, I'm just trying to find the square right here. Um, Where's Cyberpunk? From what I recall, course, you were now I can't trying to be specifically vague. Well, no, I was. what I was trying to do is I was actually trying to be specific with my selections in a way that they actually had to be real predictions, right? And we'll get into this in a minute because you promised me. <laughs> so... Cyberpunk 2077 gets a release window, but not a release date. Yeah. So I was trying to be like, I was trying to be firm in one or the other. I didn't want to give myself the ability to kind of cash in on either or. So um, I didn't think we were going to get a date. We got a date. I thought we would just get 2020. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So, I mean, yeah, some of us were more loosey goosey with our predictions uh, than others. And it, Probably we need to be a little bit more precise with what we predict for, for next year. But um, so, like, technically, I got a bingo, but I'm not proud of it because some of them are, are vague, um, just like Project Scarlet was vague. But that's one of the things I had on my list, like a new Xbox. Um, the More notably, the things that were missing that I didn't get to see was, uh, as Joe mentioned, Fable 4, none of that. Um, mm -hmm. I was really hoping, and this was super wishful thinking, but I was really hoping for a little bit of Elder Scrolls Six, six other than just the, you know, like, yeah, we're working on, but we got nothing new to show you. Um, Splinter Cell, that was already brought up as well. And I really had a feeling that uh, Avengers was going to be awful, what we saw. And while I'm not ready to say that it was great, I, I, can, I think it's safe to assume that it didn't look terrible. So, yeah, didn't check that. But when it comes to sort of vague predictions... One of our, our good friends, Dusty, and this is your cue, Rump, uh, Bill, uh, his card, I think he did get a bingo. He got a bingo got on the following bingos. things. New Forza game, new Rainbow Six game, EA brings an athlete on stage, which I think is fine. Even more Pokemon and Final Fantasy VII remake release date. Um, Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see that bingo. I'm looking. <laughs> new Forza game, new Rainbow Six. See, there's not a EA. new Forza game, though. Is there? No, there's not. Is there? No. Not really. I guess a DLC. Nah, it's not a new game, Bart. No, 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 no. He played Lucy Goosey, and I'm disqualifying his card <laughs> Same. out. Right yeah, he's he's getting burned by the uh, bingo I. police here. No, he's 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 out. He's he's out. His card doesn't even get consideration. And here's why. Um, Bethesda fail. What does that yeah, mean? That's not a thing. They did fail. That's not a thing at all. That is not a thing. Like literally, they could have had like a glitch in one of their trailers. He would have been like, well, that's a fail. 
right? Like you, you have to be specific. You have to say Bethesda's press conference is going to suck or something. Um, Crossplay is mentioned, so he's going to try to <laughs> score a bingo square on crossplay being mentioned at E3. Bill, are you? You were here last week. I said you can make this game as easier as or as hard as you want for yourself. Oh, yeah. you should not be. No, 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 no. It's not. That doesn't work for me. Well, agreed. No, but. That's no good. As easy as that. Well, what's the fun in that, though? I could just be like, E3 is going to be in California. I'm not defending um, it. I'm <laughs> saying that's that's the fatal flaw of the bingo game. Well, luckily, I've returned to disqualify his card anyway. <laughs> um, Bill is here to set what things What was the right. other one? <laughs> Bethesda Mobile. <laughs> World <laughs> premiere. World. He, <laughs> come on, man. That's not a prediction. World premiere. You're telling me that you're going to get a bingo off of a world premiere at E3. Welcome to the roast come on. of Dusty. <laughs> yeah. Buckle in. Welcome. And he's not going to come on here to defend himself. It did take 12 um, episodes on the second run for to get to this point, so it's actually quite a bit of restraint on Bill Parts, Bill's part. Another one of my favorites, more Battle Royale. Hmm. Like, yeah, come on. I mean, there there is some good stuff in there. Um, Stadia gets mentioned. Come on, that's not, <laughs> that's not a thing. Some of the ones that I think were good, just to sort of bring a bit of balance to this, is the EA bringing an athlete to the stage, which, yes, you can say is a little bit predictive, or easy to predict, but it's still very specific. I, yes, um, I like that. I, I personally like the audience collapse for too long. <laughs> Actually, on allow will allow it on humor. Yeah, yeah, allow it on humor. But it can't just be, yeah, it can't be like, the weather will be warm. You're in LA, you know? Come on. So, um, new Halo game. I thought, like, that's fine. That's specific. Um, they announced it last year. Yeah. Well, because part of the rules of, of the bingo card oh, so was I guess that didn't it can't it, be things he? that we already knew about. So he doesn't he doesn't get the new Halo game square, but I don't think that affects his bingo either. No, oh, you've but already torn his bingo apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not no, the... it's gone. I'm looking at it right now. I'm staring at it, and I'm just Sorry, Dusty, you do not head. win the non-existent prize. <laughs> Bethesda has a conference. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Sony won't be there. Like, well, you know, <laughs> Laren got that wrong, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. At least, and if he had got it wrong, I wouldn't be upset. But you know, new Assassin's Creed game. I'm surprised he didn't mark that off, just because the Assassin's Creed people are making a game or something. You know, <laughs> I have to roast Dusty, but I love the guy, so yes, he knows it. And actually, he's going to hear this two days late, but uh, we are recording this on Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to Dusty. It's not an easy job, I'm sure. And um, he does a pretty good job of muting himself when he has to yell at his kids while we play games. So <laughs> yeah, that's we all appreciate that. Can just to to even it out because I just crapped on Dusty. I will tell a quick hilarious Dusty story. Uh, back when we played Destiny once, this is a couple years ago. Playing games, Dusty goes to bed at 11 p.m. my time, which I think is like maybe 10 p.m. his time or something. I don't know. Yeah, uh, that's when he's done during the week for games. Great. So Dusty leaves. I keep playing Destiny hour goes by maybe two i don't know i wasn't keeping track and dusty joined me in a game but he didn't join the chat like he didn't come in to socialize so that was weird i'm like dusty just got up in the middle of the night so that he could play destiny with me and i started watching and like literally like as i'm going through a mission i'm not paying attention to the mission but i'm like scoping out this dusty character over there trying to figure out what's happening um and i quickly realized that that's not dusty and I sent him a message, not on the PlayStation, because the person that was imitating Dusty would have gotten the message. Um, but I'm like, I so you're playing Destiny in the middle of the night? That doesn't seem right. I, I feel like someone's playing. So he he had a it went through a period of time where his kid would wake up in the middle of the night, steal his controller, and then play games while everyone was asleep. Um, so I was playing Destiny with Dusty's son, and uh, yeah, it was it was pretty funny. Man. May I he, ask uh, how old the son is? I don't. I want to say he was. Maybe eight or nine at the time. Okay. I don't know. Funny that he would join your... Like, why wouldn't he just play? He's joining your... Like, your... Yeah, team? he wasn't a criminal mastermind, that's for <laughs> sure. So he was young. It didn't occur to him that, you know, daddy's friend might rat him out. So... Um, but I just... that We've been talking about that story for a little yes. while now. Um, I do remember Dusty, Dusty would have to uh, physically lock up his Destiny 2... Or Destiny disc the cd or blu-ray disc whatever he would have to take it out of the playstation and like lock it up at night to make sure <laughs> wow yeah yeah but that was that was good times that was a good dusty story his son uh it was a very hard mission and, he, and no offense to him but he wasn't much help so. <laughs> <laughs> but in fairness neither would dusty have been but there you go all right well you've taken it full circle you went from crapping on dusty to telling a lovely story and then a little nudge at the end um 
So let's do one last thing. This is uh, our longest episode by far, but one last thing. I want to go around the table and just um, have each of us uh, pick a winner of E3 2019. And as far as you can be as specific as mentioning a, an individual game or event or even just a, a conference, like if you want to say Microsoft won E3, cool. Cyberpunk won E3, cool. Um, let's start with you, Joe. Okay. If you had to do one thing, pick one thing. For me, it just I'm I'm looking forward to continuing to be an Xbox owner because they they made me feel good about that. I liked all that. So that makes sense. They did they did really focus on the gamer and what do you get from Microsoft? Oh yeah. So I buy that. What about you, Bill? Um, I have to. Th- I I think Nintendo probably did. If I look at everything, um, it's not that I necessarily think they'll be the biggest. Um, They'll have all the biggest games. They'll have very big games. I think Cyberpunk might be the biggest game coming, but in terms of just being kind of hitting home runs during their announcements, I think Nintendo is probably my my pick. Cool. That makes sense. Uh, how about you, Laren? Uh, well, this shouldn't be a surprise, but I'm going to say Cyberpunk 2077, game of the year already for me, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> they announced the release date. They put Keanu Reeves in the game, and he's not just a cameo, he's actually Johnny Silverhand, so he's going to be like your Cortana through the whole game. And they made a really awesome uh, collector's edition, they have all this stuff ready to go. Now they just need to make the CD Projekt Red store available in the States, that's the only thing uh, that yes. I'm waiting for now, um, so I can get one of those really cool jackets. But And it, and it is coming, about- they're saying... Even for PC, like they're bringing the collector's edition to different markets and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, but their uh, CD Projekt Red store, their merchandise store, is only available to ship to the EU currently. Oh. So, kind of broke my heart because they have some really cool stuff there. Uh, but anyway, Cyberpunk definitely was my my game of show for E3. Well, and for me, I'm gonna kind of piggyback on a combination of what Joe and Laren said. And for me specifically, whoever the person or event that won E3 for me is whoever was in charge of keeping Keanu Reeves a secret. Because with all the stuff that was leaking out prior to E3, and I had said before that it's starting to get to the point where there's actually no surprises, I was genuinely surprised when Keanu Reeves walked up on stage. So this isn't so much a um, a verdict of how good I think Cyberpunk's going to be. I just think that that was really cool that they managed to pull off a genuine surprise. Which doesn't happen a lot anymore these days with reporters and leaks and publishers and suppliers and like it seems like stuff is leaking out everywhere and i mentioned in the last episode about how i would not want to be working in a marketing department anywhere because it's so got to be so stressful keeping any kind of secret and joe you mentioned that as well when it comes to launching anything that you don't want to leak before it's tough and kudos to those people involved so all right in order to keep this under two hours uh, I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Zippo on Twitter who asked if we were going to do a longer E3 episode. And I said, I think we might when we talk about E3 in our recap. And here you go. If you made it all the way to the end, truly appreciate it. This episode goes live Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific time, as it does every week at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at push to talk FM and on the web at uh, push to talk dot FM. And I want to once again thank you, Laren, for stepping in while Bill was away and not feeling so great. And um, really appreciate it. And I have a very distinct feeling that you'll be back very soon because I will be gone the week after next. So maybe if Joe and Bill are up to it, you could join them to do the podcast then. But I'll leave that up to you. You don't need to answer that now. But again, thank you for stepping up. Thanks for having me. Any closing words from Joe and Bill? Bill, it's good to see that you're sounding sounding better again. You're, you don't sound a little rough but you don't sound as bad as you did a couple weeks ago yeah we should be uh we should be on the rise each week so probably by cyberpunk i'll sound somewhat normal <laughs> god that's a that's a really slow immune system you got there pal no it's not my immune system i i physically destroyed my throat it's not even a yeah anyway it's just it's broken <laughs> so. here's to your repair exactly so thanks again everybody for tuning in and we'll catch you again next week 